Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm an old history teacher myself, and I'm always glad to look at historical th other things and so on, and you guys are to be commended for the job that you do. Uh, first of all, well, I presume what I'm going to talk about today is this book uh, that I wrote last year with the assistance of a lady right over here, Gretchen Griffin. Uh, I'm not a noted author, uh, but about uh, two years ago, I had the pleasure to speak at the town of Gamewell. I helped incorporate the town of Gamewell, and uh, I, I spoke to people out there at the time. They dedicated a new building, and then I had some of my former legislators that I had served with in in the legislature. I served three terms in the North Carolina House and uh, six or seven terms in the Senate, in a total of 31 years. And a lot of my colleagues said, Don, why don't you write a book? Well, the people at Gamble suggested the same thing. And I'm not a great author. Uh, I'm a history major, not an English major. <laughs> and it's quite obvious if you read the book. But anyhow, uh, I fell and broke my wrist year before last, could do nothing else. So I decided to write the book. And uh, in fact, I enjoyed it. I, w I wish now, Gretchen, that I could write it again because I would have changed some things. But it was, it was quite an interesting thing to do. Uh, the one thing that I would like to state, first of all, a lot of people say, well, to run for any political office that you've got to have a lot of money or you've got to have connections, that's not true. And of course, I'm the best example because I didn't have a lot of money. I was a school teacher. And of course, the Kincaids are pretty well noted in the Gamel community, but just believe in a cause and being willing to work and you can be elected. The first time I filed for the Senate, for the House, the North Carolina General Assembly, uh, we Republicans, and this is definitely not going to be a partisan talk, but I have to mention, uh, interject a little bit of politics. And this was in the year 1964, which is probably before some of you folks were even born. but. There were no Republicans in Caldwell County at that time, very few. I attended a little church in Gamewell called Grandview Park, and in that church was Keith Snyder and his wife, his mother, his mother, as well as his sister, Patsy. We all Republicans, and Keith, and I know you've heard Brent Kincaid, he's a little older than me. He later was, he and I both were raised on Kincaid Hill. Uh, in the game of community. Brent was later president of the Brawl Hills Corporation. Uh, they asked me to get involved in politics. I was teaching school at the time at Happy Valley. Uh, in fact, I want to mention here, uh, in the article in the paper, you mentioned that I taught at Oak Hill and that I taught at, at first year at High Brighton. But my three years that I really enjoyed when I got out of college, I was teaching at Happy Valley. That's the first Happy Valley High School. That's the first job I had. But anyhow, uh, Keith came to me back in 64. I started teaching in 1960. And Keith said, Don, uh, we need you to run for something. We, we don't have any candidates. <laughs> we had to beg people to run. In fact, where my office is located now, right beside of that was a building called Smith Cross, a uh, Smith Printing. And about this, I reckon you'd call it a Republican convention, but there were six or seven people there, Brent Kincaid, Hugh Wilson, Keith Snyder, Frank Smith, uh, and some old timers. And they suggested that we were trying to find people to run for different candidates, different offices. At the time, I had started my insurance agency part-time. And I told Keith, who is a Gamewell graduate, 
In fact, I'm proud to say in the little town of Game, little, little community of Game, we had three noted attorneys that I can think about, Keith Snyder, Bruce Cannon, and uh, Dustin Hall, our current representative in the General Assembly. These are all native people of Gamel community. But anyhow, uh, they wanted me to run for clerk of court because we couldn't get anybody else to run. And I said, no, I said, that's a full-time job. Well, next day I saw my picture in the paper, news topic. It said, Keith Cade files for the clerk of court. And I called Keith and I said, Keith, where did this come from? This, I can't do it. I'm starting my business part-time and teaching on the side. And he said, well, Don, we've got to have some, some candidates. I said, well, what have you got that's part-time? He said, well, we need a candidate for the North Carolina House. So I said, okay, I'll run for the House. Next day in the paper, I thought this was the kiss of death politically, but my picture was in the paper again. It said, Kenny Cade changed his mind. Files for the North Carolina House. Well, the, anyhow, the election of 1966 came along, and uh, it was a pretty good year for Republicans. Again, we were still growing. I was in a three-seat district with Carwell, Burke, and Alexander County. Earl Tate, the mayor of Lenore, I know some of you folks have heard of Earl. He did a good job. Sam Irvin the, the third, the, the senator's son, those were the two incumbent representatives. And I and another lady, a lady from Alexander County, an attorney, Tracy Boyd Fletcher, we were the Republican candidates. And the election was held in the fall, of course, in 66. And I was, well, I was lucky to win, in fact, it's the closest election I ever had. I think I won by 250 votes. I didn't even know it won the next morning. I'd gone to teach. I was teaching at High Brighton, first year at High Brighton, and my wife called me and she said, I want you to know that you won a seat to the North Carolina General Assembly. Well, in those days, I know I was the first Republican sitting classroom teacher to be elected to the North Carolina General Assembly. I'm pretty sure I was the first sitting classroom teacher to be elected to the General Assembly because uh, in those days you had to, you couldn't serve as a teacher in the General Assembly. I knew if I'd be elected, I'd have to resign from teaching, which I did. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's the funny thing about that particular election I, as I was campaigning, uh, well, that day during my day of teaching at Oak Hill, uh, Gene White, probably some of you remember Gene White, he was the superintendent of schools for a few years later, and also in the House. I expected to be fired, quite frankly, because you just couldn't be a Republican and, and be a teacher in those days. and. Anyhow, someone knocked on my door at one o'clock in the afternoon, and I said, uh-oh, here he comes. Gene White, the assistant, superintendent of schools, met me at the door. And he said, Mr. Kincaid, I want to congratulate you, our office congratulates you. We wish you good luck. That's when I filed in, in the spring. And then in the fall, of course, I was at Highbright. In fact, it's funny, later when I had served in the House and then in the Senate, Gene White ran for the House. He had retired as a superintendent, and he served one, one term in the North Carolina House. He, he did, a good, did a good job. But anyhow, uh, I went to Raleigh, and to serve in the General Assembly, you don't have to be an attorney. It helps. But the North Carolina General Assembly is part-time General Assembly. It's made up of well, teachers, of course, farmers, undertakers. I, in fact, some of the most successful members of the General Assembly are undertakers for the simple reason, think about an undertaker, and he meets all these people during all these funerals, and it's hard to vote against an undertaker. <laughs> but anyhow, the General Assembly, 
is made up of all types of occupations. You don't have to be an attorney. But I did go to Raleigh, and I was shocked. The one, uh, in fact, Earl Tate, myself, and Sam Irving, the two Democrats, and I were the three that were elected. And uh, I expected, I figured I'd have a little problem, but Earl Tate helped me a lot, even though we were different political parties. He befriended me quite a bit, introduced me to different people in Raleigh. However, we had one major problem, and this would shock you people in here. Uh, very few of you know the background, probably, of the school board. In fact, I, I guess you may know now because of the book. And all this, most of this is in this wisdom here, if you want a copy of it. But in those days, when I was teaching, and when I went, first went to General Assembly, the school boards were chosen in North Carolina by the Democrat Party. Had for, and they did a good job. When I taught school seven years, I taught under this system, and our school board at the time was chosen this way, and quite frankly, it, I could name you some very good school board members. However, I just seem to think by being a history teacher and and noting, and I did, I do know I had one bad experience when I got out of college. I wanted to teach it in Watauga County, and they made it plain. And we don't hire Republican teachers. I'm, I'm sorry, that's the way it was. But anyhow, I decided to put in a bill in the legislature to change the mode of which we choose the school board to let the people vote on it. The public overwhelmingly supported this idea. Uh, however, my colleague Earl Tate and Sam Irvin, they told me, said, Don, our people don't like this. I said, well, I'm going to put the bill in, and I hope you help me get it through. They got it killed. I told them that I would use this against you the next election. This is 68. And come the 1968 election, uh, me and two other people, Bill Fulton from Morton and uh, Terrell Austin from Alexander County, we were the three Republicans for these three seats against Earl Tate, uh, 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 Sam Irvin the third, and someone else. And I did use the issue that the fact that they got my bill killed and they were defeated. Now, I need to tell you here, that may have not been the only reason, but it was one of the reasons that they were defeated because I did use this as an issue. All elections, I found out, and I went through probably about 16 elections during my time in the General Assembly through primaries and general elections. All elections are cyclical. You, a, a candidate, whether you ran for sheriff, general assembly, governor, or whatever, uh, you can only control about 60 to 70 percent of your vote. The other part depends on what's the mood of the public at that time. And I, I can recall the year of Watergate a little bit later. Uh, we just got beat bad by that, I mean, Republican Party. But anyhow, in 1968, the, uh, those guys were defeated, and I put in the bill again to elect the school board by the vote of the people. Well, other members of the General Assembly, Democrat and Republican, they can see that this was on the mind of the people. This is, this is what the people were wanting at that time. So the guy from the Senator Representative Gaston County did put in a bill, and the Representative from Davidson County put in a bill, and lo and behold, we had 30 or 40 bills put in to let the people vote on the school board. So we decided to put them all together, rather than have individual local bills, to have a statewide bill. And that's what we did. Now it came, regarding Carwell County, I did have the choice of whether making this a partisan or nonpartisan piece of legislation. I, I chose to make it nonpartisan. That's the way the law is written. I also chose to have, I had the choice of having an election in the spring of the year during the primaries. In those days, Denver Republicans didn't have primaries. Uh, I chose to have the election in the fall of the year, and that's the law. Today, 
Well, it, it was enacted in the law, and that's the day you vote on the school board. In fact, I noticed last night they, pretty, they had a pretty good issue uh, regarding mass standing for the school board. I served uh, in, the, in the House for three terms, and then in 1972, I decided to run. Well, they already had, had been elected uh, to the Senate in my last term in the House, and they decided not to run again, so I, I decided to run for the Senate. Uh, the legislature redistricted, they have to redistrict every 10 years by the United States Constitution. Uh, every state redistricted the congressional seats as well as the legislative seats. So uh, they they put the, the, the new old Senate district was Carwell and Burke. And when and the old senator when I was in the house, uh, Joe Burr, uh, one of the one of one of the best senators that you guys had, was a, probably a guy you don't even know, uh, Dennis Cook. The dentist, Dennis Cook Sr., he had a son that was a dentist. He was, uh, Dennis was a Democrat. I'll never forget though, when I was, he was no longer in the legislature when, when I was elected to the House. I'll never forget he came to my office. Yeah, he right down the street and he said, Don, I don't know you too well, but he said, we a big problem we got in the body is we got too many laws, too many bills. He said, for every bill you put in, uh, take two away. He said, we got too much, too many laws. Well, I, I tried to follow his advice. He was, he was a great senator, and I appreciate the advice. But anyhow, in the Senate, <clears throat> in the House, I had to run for three counties. <clears throat> in the Senate in 72, uh, again, the legislature was controlled by Democrats. And they gerrymandered just like Republicans now gerrymander. You, a lot of people are critical of this, but quite frankly, I don't know of any other way to do it. Other, uh, other to make it pure Democratic, and that would never happen. But the new Senate district that I was running in composed of six counties, two senators. I think in those days, one senator, uh, the, the numbers in the General Assembly have always been 50 senators and 120 House members. It's been that way for over 100 years. And of course, every 10 years, you redistrict. In those days, a representative represented approximately 47,000 people. A senator represented approximately 150,000 people in those days. It's probably changed a little bit today. But anyhow, I had to run in uh, well, the only two counties I kept was Carwell and Burke. I, I was known in those two counties, but I had to run in Wilkes County. I knew no one. I had to run in Watauga County. I knew a few people because I went to school at Boone and I knew some folks from up there. I had to run in Avery County and I knew no one. And I had to run in Mitchell County. And I'm telling you folks, those mountain people are tough. There, there's no Kincaid's in Mitchell County. There are no Kincaid's in Avery County. They're all Buchanan's and Hughes's. If you ever see the name Gooch, I only know of Gooch's that come from one county, Mitchell County. It's funny, but that's the way it is. Uh, Sebastian, there, the only place I know Sebastian's in Western North Carolina are in Wilkes County. So I had to learn all of this, and I'm telling you, that 72 election was the toughest and the most interesting that I ever had. I really, did a lot of work. I traveled a lot. Didn't have a lot of money, but I had a little brown pickup and one big picture. And I'd go into the town and I'd stop outside and put my picture in the back of my truck. And I'd go from. In those days, you could campaign in store to store. You can't do that today because today the stores are they're not like they were in those days. People gathered around those stores at that time. Now in the Senate, at that time, uh, I was a resident of Gamel, and born and raised in Gamel. Uh, and uh, in fact, the title of my book, I wanted it to be from Shushan Boy to State Senator, and Gretchen re recommended we put reflection at the top of it. 
But I, my first job, I was eight years old. I shined shoes over at Roof White store in the game of community. And I'd walk home on Saturday night, just during the latter part of the war, and World War II, that is. And uh, Gretchen, I wasn't talking about the Civil War. <laughs> uh, I wasn't talking about Vietnam War either. Or, uh, but anyhow, I'd go home on Saturday night after working all day Saturday, shining shoes with two or three bucks in my pocket. And I was the richest guy on Kincaid Hill. Nobody else had any money. Man, you have $3 back then. It was quite something. But anyhow, uh, by the fact that I'm a game, and at that time, the, the, the strongest political organization lobbying group in the state at that time was the North Carolina League of Municipalities. Now, you guys here, by this being the historical museum, should know quite a bit about what I'm getting ready to say. The General Assembly of North Carolina, our, our Constitution is very similar to the United States Constitution. Very similar. Executive, legislative, judicial, representatives, county commissioners. Very similar. <clears throat> uh, but the League of Municipalities, which was all the towns in, in, in the area, they were very powerful in the General Assembly. And consequently, the towns could do just about anything they wanted. And we've had some good, Lenore's a great town. In fact, this county was created by the North Carolina General Assembly in 1841. You need to read the history of that county. Maybe you guys have already studied here. But that's when the county was created. The General Assembly created it. I think the last county to be created was Avery County. And that was right at the turn of the century. Uh, 1851, the General Assembly created the town of Lenore in 1851 as the county seat of the county. Well, in those days, the cities, there are three ways that you, the cities could annex property in order to grow. You had voluntary annexation, uh, and that's where a group of people outside of the, the limits of a town uh, could say, okay, we, we, we would like to be part of Lenore. So they petitioned Lenore, and Lenore would voluntarily annex them. But when a, when a town annex them, they got to provide those people the same services that they do the citizens of the city itself. The second way of, annex, of annexing is involuntary annexation. And that was very unpopular. And a more unpopular system than that is called satellite annexation. That's where a city could go out into a county a mile or two and take out just a little part of that community to be part of the city. It's called involuntary annexation. Well, we had a person in the Gamble community who wanted to sell beer and of course, Gamewell was a dry community at the time. And uh, he petitioned, he came to Lenore, and the Lenore City Council voted three to three to satellite annex that store. That tied it. The mayor of Lenore at the time, Bob Gibbons, broke the tie. And consequently, the, they went out into the Gamewell community and annexed this community, this, this one store to permit the guy to sell beer. Well, some of me being a resident of Gamble, and some of the people, I can, I'm going by names now, but I hope I don't forget any. Sonny Michael, Bruce Callum was one of them. Uh, uh, Jack Roberts, uh, John uh, uh, Wooten, uh, those are some of the people that came to me and said, Don, oh, oh Pedro Crump was one of them, and said, we would like you to put in a bill to create the town of Gamble. Uh, I said, I'll do it, providing the people vote on it. You don't have to. A legislator can create a town by stroke of the pen. Of course, the legislature would have to pass the law. But I, I told Sonny, I said, 
I'll put the bill in, providing the people vote. He said, that'd be fine. So those guys got together and created the boundary of what the net title name, game on now is. And then I introduced the bill. I believe at that time, keep in mind there were two senators. Uh, I think my colleague in the Senate was John, uh, Jim Edwards, who was a Democrat. And of course, behind the scenes, he was sort of against this. Uh, well, I did get the bill passed in the Senate, but it did have a provision that the citizens of this described area would vote on whether they want to become a town or not. Then we got the bill has to pass the House. Of course, I was not, no longer a member of the House, so the bill, the legislation went over to the House, and there a little camera started taking place and uh, gamesmanship, if you wish. And, uh, one representative, a Democrat representative from, uh, I'd rather not even call the county, but he was a pretty powerful guy. And, and the Democrats controlled the General Assembly at that time. Usually I could get local bills through, though. Uh, but anyhow, he came to me and said, Don, I'll tell you what, your bill's in my committee. He's the chairman of a rules committee in the House. He said, I'll get your bill out of committee providing you support a bill that I want. Well, I didn't like his bill. It was a very unpopular bill. And I told him, I said, look, this is a local bill. It, I, it has nothing to do with the state of North Carolina. I said, if you get this bill stopped in the House, you're not going to tangle. Of course, back then, I, I was a little braver than I am today. <laughs> but anyhow, over his uh, objection, the bill passed the House, the town of Gamble was created, uh, and after that, then they had an election in Gamble, and uh, Sonny Michael, I think, was the first mayor. Uh, and then later, other, uh, uh, got Hamby, uh, Herman, uh, Herman called me from down in Cager's Mountain and said, Don, we'd like to have a bill put in to create the town of Cager's Mountain. Because Lenore was looking that way at the time. So I put in the bill to create the town of Cajun Mountain. Then later, I was with my colleagues in the house at the time, Edgar Starnes, we created the town of Sawmills, and I represented Burke County, and I helped, I created the town of Rutherford College in, in Burke County, and then later, represented Navy County, I created the town of uh, Grandfather Mountain, and then Later, I created the town of Beach Mountain and Sugar Mountain. And the last town that I helped create, I believe Edgar Starnes and I were represented in the house at the time. We created the village of Cedar Rock. That's, now, during those, those days, again, I mentioned the history of, and the power of the League of Municipalities. The laws changed today, though. It's tougher to create towns today but it's also tougher today for the towns to cherry pick. They can't, what Lenore was doing was going into Carver County and picking the places where the tax base was pretty high, but they wouldn't go into the slum areas of the county, uh, even though it bordered the town of Lenore. Well, the towns have got more democratic about it, and it, it's, today it's changed, but that was one of the most interesting things that happened to me in the General Assembly. Uh, and another thing interesting that I can think about, and I, I did help, though I was a member of the minority party, um, and by the way, speaking of Lenore, I, I got along very well with the town of Lenore. Other than that, Jerry Brooks, uh, the mayor of Lenore, come to me to put in a bill to choose to elect a mayor for every four years rather than two. I gladly worked with him on it, became law. I helped the, town, the towns on a lot of their legislation. We just differed on that theory of annexation. You got to have towns. They got to have the ability to grow. Uh, but another interesting bill, and I, I can think of many, this is probably the most important bill that I personally introduced was just before I got out of the General Assembly. I think it was 1995, I believe, 94. Uh, I happened to be reading the newspaper one day, and the town of Durham, 
this, these people had come into this guy's house. They had broke into his house, and he got his gun and shot and killed one of them. And he had, the article in the paper was the fact that the guy had to refinance his house and buy $100,000 to cost to defend himself in court. And I, I got to thinking, you know, this is wrong. You should be able to defend your own property. Now, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but I had, I had to learn a lot of law on it. So I got to doing some work on this, and I got copies of laws in other states to, that, to give you the right to use any force to protect your property in the case you're invaded. Uh, they had a law in Colorado and one in Indiana. I think those were two states. I liked their laws. I put those together and I put it into legislation. And I introduced the bill, Senate Bill 895. I remember very well the name of the legislation. Of course, in those days, right now you see on the news a lot about crime. Well, in the early 90s, that was a similar atmosphere throughout the United States. And a lot of your states were coddling criminals at the time. Uh, it was just the right time, the right moment to put in this type of legislation. When I put the bill in, I didn't know it was going to happen, but all the talk radio in North Carolina uh, got on my side. Now, in the General Assembly, everything we do in the General Assembly is by committee. Very seldom, well, of course, we vote on the floor of the Senate, but all the work is done in committee, and I think you can understand why. We have 50 senators or 120 members in the House. Can you imagine 120 members of the House getting together and debating a bill like Senate Bill 895? It'd be impossible. You've got to go to committee. You, you have to go to committees so that's the, the, the chairman of the committee was very powerful. My bill was sent to the Senate Judiciary Committee, and the chairman, I'll never forget that rascal's name, <laughs> Senator Frank Ballas from Halifax County, was opposed to my legislation. Well, what he did, he didn't take no action on it. And then one, one day when the legislature allegedly was not in session, he and a couple members of the committee met, and they killed my bill. And I was upset. By those days, I had a little bit of cloud in the General Assembly, even though I was a Republican, and I had a lot of friends. Mark Bassnott was the pro tem of the Senate, my, one of my best friends. I said, Mark, I don't like this. He sort of grinned about it. The next day, I did something. In all my 31 years in the General Assembly, I'd never seen done before, I rose to the floor of the Senate. And we got a rule that had never been used before. And that rule says that if a committee doesn't take proper action on your bill, you can rise to the, on the floor of the Senate, of the 50 senators, and demand that that bill come out of committee, come to the floor of the Senate, and then all 50 senators vote on it. Well, uh, Mark Bassnott, again, the pro tem of the Senate, uh, I made the motion to bring the bill from Frank Ballas's committee and the full Senate vote on it. The, the Rules Committee chairman at the time was Tony Rand from Fayetteville, another good friend of mine, though, a pretty strong Democrat. He, 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 admit, he got up and made a substitute motion. He said, Mr. Chairman, I make a substitute motion that a little bit, Senator Kincaid, I make a motion that this bill be brought up in J Committee tomorrow and, and before the full committee and the J Judiciary Committee then voted on the bill. They voted it out of the committee. It, got, it voted to the Senate. I think only six or seven senators voted against it. They're afraid to. It would be political suicide to vote against it. It got over in the House, and I, I'll never forget at the time, Dave Flaherty Jr. was in our representative in the House at the time. Dave was an attorney, 
An attorney could explain it much better than I did, but they've helped me quite a bit in the House, but the Speaker of the House, the, the presiding officer of the House, objected to my bill. He didn't like it, and I'm not going to explain the reason why I'll do it individually, but the Speaker of the House opposed the bill. However, all the talk radio people in North Carolina favored it. Um, uh, the speaker called me, and he said, Don, what am I going to do to get these people off my back? <laughs> I said, I want you to bring the bill up in the House. All right, what they did in the House, uh, he put some ground rules. He had a, a, a spokesman from the University of North Carolina Law School, a spokesman from the Duke Law School, and a spokesman from the Campbell Law School to come before the committee in the House, and do we need Senator Kincaid's bill? Is it needed? Two of the three professors said it is needed. Uh, the Carolina gentleman objected to it. The Duke guy and the Campbell guy said it's needed. So came out of the House, the House voted on it, and it's now law. I just, that's the way the General Assembly works. You have to do a lot of work behind the scenes. Now, uh, I do want to mention uh, one more thing, and this goes into maybe the book, but especially today, it's in today what's going on. And this will shock you when I tell you this. Folks, when you're born in the United States as a citizen, you have the right to assemble, the right to free speech, but you do not have the right to vote. Not by being born. Read the United States Constitution. It defines the laws of the Constitution and the Tenth Amendment to the Bill of Rights. Those laws not regulated by the United States government will be <laughs> will be related back to the respective states. Every state can declare and design the rules for you to vote in that state. That's why the rules in North Carolina are totally different from those in South Carolina or California. People today, you hear all this crap on television today about what uh, trying to federalize, or, but think about the Constitution. It says that every state shall design the rules for you to vote in that state. Now, uh, I will say, and with that, I'm going to interject one thing here, uh, and this is why we must have a strong public school system, because we are a republic. We're not a true democracy. A republic elects their representatives, whether it be county, school board, legislature, senators, or president. And quite frankly, for you to vote, you need to be intelligent enough to vote. You don't particularly, by the, oh, I was born in North Carolina. I have the right to vote. No, you don't. You've got to meet the qualifications set up by the state of North Carolina. And that's why you, if, you don't, if, if we didn't have public schools, good public schools, that teach what a good lesson in civics, and that's where we're falling down today, uh, the responsibility of being a citizen, uh, this idea of mailing out right in ballots, that's one of the greatest dangers that we have in this republic that we live in. I, I noticed recently they're having a, a runoff election in California for governor. The governor and his, his executive branch of government mailed out ballots to everybody in the state. That's ridiculous. That is a ground, it's a breeding ground for Corruption. Can you imagine in the big cities like Chicago and New York and maybe even Charlotte where you've got big housing complexes and eight, uh, three or 400 people living, have a mailing address in one complex and they mail all the ballots to that one complex? One guy that owns that complex well, could illegally vote for all the people in that complex. We, you, write in ballots will destroy this country. 
If we'd have had right in balance, I would never have run. Uh, when you, uh, voting is a privilege. And if you put on your mask, I realize we have the pandemic, the, the COVID-19 and all that, but if you put on your mask and go buy groceries, you can also put on your mask and go vote. I remember when I, all the elections I went through, we, in those days, we had absentee balloting. I favor absentee balloting. We need it. It's designed for those people in service, those people that are physically incapable of voting. Uh, many times when I voted, when, when I campaigned, we had people drive up the election day out in the car and someone, to, a, a, a representative from working on the polls that day would come out, bring a ballot out to that person, and they would vote. You can't mail out the ballots. You have to, it will destroy the, uh, the principle of the Republican form of government. The, uh, and the last thing I, I'm gonna mention, and then I'll throw it open to questions, this ties into voting. I know you've heard recently, and this goes back into my field as a history teacher and, this, and what you guys stand for in this organization. I know you've heard of the uh, 1619 Project, the, uh, the, the uh, what they call it, the uh, CVT, you know, where the, the uh, what's the word I'm trying to thank today? Um, Pardon? Critical, Critical voting theory, CVT. Thank you. Critical voting theory. There are two ladies, Nicole Hannah Jones is one of the, pop, the people pushing this. Another lady is Gloria Loman Billings, and the last two names are hyphenated. They call it the 1619 Project. Well, the critical race theory goes back even before that, but it basically pits one race against the other one. Uh, we can't have that. They, they claim that in 1619, uh, the, we fought the Revolutionary War to protect slavery. Well, think about the Revolutionary War. This is the farthest from the truth. Who were the backers? Who were the Tories during the Revolutionary War? The loyalists, as they call them. These were your plantation owners that owned the cotton plantations down east, owned the tobacco plantations, that owned the rice plantations. Who were they selling these products to? Not in the United States, the 13 colonies. They were to sell them abroad to England. If they were wanting to proper promote slavery, <laughs> they, these were the people that actually opposed the revolution. You need to think about that when you think about the 1619 Project and the critical race theory. Uh, uh, it, this would destroy, in my opinion, our republic. We can't have it. We, uh, uh, we, we gradually, we fought the Civil War to free the slaves. It's been an evolutionary process. Uh, you don't, I, I, I'm proud to say the fact that when I was elected to General Assembly, I came from probably the most humble background that you could in North Carolina. And I did it by hard work. Had nothing to do with race. Some of my best friends are black people. Some of my best, my best clients today are black folks. Uh, but we can't pit one race against the other. We can't teach fourth and fifth grade kids. You should be ashamed to be a white person. It's the wrong theory. A lot of states are now passing legislation to ban this. North Carolina hadn't done it yet. I'm hoping that they do. In fact, I noticed Tennessee just voted, the legislature voted last year. But anyhow, uh, please pay attention because it definitely involves the preservation of this republic. Now, anybody got any questions? It's a pleasure to be with you. And, uh, I can never, well, I'm no longer in the General Assembly, but I'll be glad to give you some advice occasionally, okay? Thank you very much.